In this video we're looking at how I made this 48 key hand-wired 3D printable keyboard. Even the keys here are printed. I'll be going through how to do the hand wiring and also show you everything you need to know to get the keyboard up and running. The design files will be available for free in the description below as well as links to all products used in this video. I made two keycap layouts for this keyboard. The first one is Norwegian and it's the one I'm using. I tried to make the other layout as close I could to the standard US layout, so please let me know if there are any important symbols or functions that I may have missed here, because the keys can easily be modified and programmed into the firmware if needed. Each individual key can be selected and modified manually in the supplied SketchUp file, and I also made another file containing a guide to how you can make your own keycaps. With a 0.4mm nozzle and a 0.2mm layer height, the keyboard main chassis and bottom cover took about 15 hours to print using these settings shown here. Once the print is finished, the first thing to do is to install the stabilizers for the wider keycaps like Space, Backspace, Caps Lock and Shift. Without the stabilizers, these keycaps will be very wobbly and hard to use. I personally cut off these guiding corners on the stabilizers as it seemed to make the keycaps run a lot smoother and as far as I know, they behave just the same without. When it comes to the stabilizer for the spacebar, because this is an unconventional keyboard size, I had to bend the stabilizer down to 60mm to make it fit. The mechanical switches I'm using are Gatoron yellows and I chose these because they sound pretty good in my opinion and are also pretty cheap. The switches are easy to install by just pushing them down until they snap in place. Now let's look at how to wire the switches. For this we're going to need some diodes, in this case 1N4148 diodes, which are commonly used in hand-wired keyboards. Diodes are electrical components that only allow current to flow in one direction and will prevent it from going back. What we essentially want is to create sort of like a grid where we wire the switches in horizontal rows and crossing vertical columns. This will make the controller able to understand which exact key is pushed based on what row crosses what column. Here you see how the diodes should be wired. The little mark on the diode should face away from the switch pin because this little mark indicates the direction of electrical flow. The easiest way to make the rows is simply by joining the diodes like I've done here, where every diode is bent and soldered onto the next one, all the way across the row. It's also a good idea to pre-apply solder to all the pins as this will make attaching the diodes a lot easier. To speed things up a little, I pre-bent all the diodes like this into a U-shape before starting to solder them in place. And again, it's important to have that little mark on the diode facing away from the switch, otherwise the switch will not work. After soldering, you can cut away the top portion of the diode as it will just be in the way for later. Once all the diodes are in place, it should look something like this. Before moving on, do a quick overview just to check that all the diodes are installed in the right direction. Now it's time to look at the columns. The columns are the vertical wires in the matrix and when wiring it like this, the controller can now determine which exact key is pushed based on where a specific column crosses a specific row. This wiring diagram shows the way the columns need to be wired for the firmware to read it correctly. Using a thin cable, mark out the distance between each pin with a sharpie to know where to remove the insulation. There's a few different ways to do this step and I'll leave a link down in the description of this video that shows some optional ways of doing the wiring. Once the insulation is removed, simply solder the cable to all the pins for each column. And here it's also a good idea to pre-apply solder to all the switch pins to speed up the process. Repeat this step until all the columns are wired following the diagram showed earlier. And when it's done, it should look something like this. At this point I use my soldering iron to heat up and push in place some M3 threaded inserts for the screws that will attach the bottom cover plate. The microcontroller used in this build is a Pro Micro development board. It's got a micro USB port and its brain is the Atmega 32U4 microchip. The Pro Micro fits snugly into this little bracket that fits onto the slot on the main assembly and will be clamped in place once the bottom plate is attached later. 
wiring the controller is pretty straightforward. I have labeled the rows in numbers 4, 3, 2 and 1. Row 4, which is the bottom row, will go to pin A0. Row 3 go to pin A1, row 2 to pin A2 and row 1 to pin A3. When it comes to the columns, we start on the opposite side from the left. Column 1 goes to pin RX1, column 2 goes to pin 2, column 3 goes to pin 3 and so on. The full list of pins will be displayed on the screen. But it's pretty straightforward, the next column will simply be soldered onto the next pin on the controller all the way around until pin 15. Once all the wiring is done, it's time to look at the firmware. We'll be using QMK firmware for this keyboard and the first thing to do is to download something called QMK Toolbox, which is a tool we will be using to flash the firmware onto the microcontroller. Simply download the zip file from GitHub and install the program. Inside the QMK Toolbox we can now click open and select the firmware we want to be flashing onto the keyboard. We can now plug in the micro USB cable and it should power up. But wait, nothing shows up in the program and we're not able to press flash. That's because the Pro Micro is set up to be just a regular USB device unless you manually tell it you want to flash it. And to do that we need a short cable like this and we need to short the pins GND and RST, which is ground and reset. Now there should be a red light and it will show up in the QMK toolbox. You can now click flash and it will flash the firmware onto the keyboard and then automatically disconnect and go back to being just a regular USB device, but this time with the keyboard firmware installed. Optionally, if you do want to change the key map, you can head over to kbfirmware.com and upload the .json file I supplied. This is going to load the key map configuration for the firmware. And these first two pages you don't really need to touch because it's been set up for this specific keyboard wiring and microcontroller pinout. What you may want to change on the other hand is the one called key map and it consists of multiple layers where layer 0 is the base layer which is the main key for each individual key press. Then you have the layers 1, 2 and 3 which are all associated with each their function key which I've labeled as SIM to activate the top row symbols, the red function key for all the keys marked in red and a blue function key for all the keys marked in blue. For all the keys marked TRNS it just means that no key is selected here. If you've done some modifications you can go to settings and change the file name to whatever you want and save the configuration. This gives you a .json file that you can open on this web page later if you need to make further modifications. Then you can go to compile where you can download a .hex file for the layout that can be flashed onto the microcontroller the same way as I showed before with the QMK toolbox. Once the flashing is done you should test your keyboard to make sure every key works as intended. And if it does, then great. We can now attach the bottom plate using some M3 hard drive screws. And the main assembly is now done. And all that's left now is to make the keycaps. The keycaps were printed on the Ender 3 V2 with a 0.2mm nozzle. I tried using the stock 0.4mm nozzle, but I didn't feel like the tiny details on the keycaps were good enough. The 0.2mm nozzle allows for great detail, but at the cost of print time. After all the keycaps have been printed, there's just one final step, coloring the keycaps. The way I colored the keycaps was to use a very small sharp pink brush and regular acrylic paint to fill the letters and symbols with different colors according to their functionality. And it's important to make sure you push the paint all the way down into the letters and symbols so it covers evenly and make sure to apply a pretty thick coat as the PLA seems to soak up some of it. After painting I left them to dry overnight, before sanding each individual keycap on all sides with some 240 grit sandpaper to remove any excess paint, leaving only the paint inside the letters left. I do recommend doing this sanding outside as it does create quite a bit of dust. Now all that's left is to fit the keycaps onto the keyboard and be careful around the stabilized keys as you may need to wiggle them carefully into place. And also make sure they move smoothly up and down. And we are done! I'm really happy with the end result, especially considering this is my first ever keyboard build. This is actually the first mechanical keyboard I ever own. And yes, I'm aware, it got maybe a little bit thick, but hey, there's a first time for everything, right? And some of you may wonder, how does this keyboard sound? 
Well, I've got you covered. And remember, all the files are available for free through the Thingiverse link below the video, as well as links to all parts used in the build. Thank you for watching, I really hope you enjoyed the video and learned something new today. Feel free to leave a like or subscribe to the channel for fun projects like this and more in the future. And happy keyboarding, or what you call it. If you have any questions regarding the build, feel free to post them down in the comments below and I'll happily answer them.